<laughs> well, welcome, Nathan Eccleston, to the In Conversation series that I've been doing. So you're here in Dubai, and I met you through our wonderful mutual friend, Michael Russo, one of the half of Ralph and Russo, the, the designers. So if you can tell me like a little bit more about you, obviously, I think you're probably most well known for having played soccer in the UK um, for Liverpool. But how long was that for? Yeah, I was at Liverpool for six and a half seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I signed for them as a, as a junior in their academy. And then I come through the ranks at the academy and I went on to play nine first team senior appearances for the first team. So I was there for six and a half years. And sure. then I went to, um, to other footballing teams in the UK and, and abroad. Was it always something that you wanted to do? Like, were you always on the path to being a soccer player when you were younger? Or was it sort of just something that you happened to be great at? So it was the natural progression into, into playing? Um, I mean, my parents would probably think that I was great. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure if I... That was ever the title, but yeah, I think you from a kid, had talent to begin with. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it was just football in, in in England is our national sport anyway, and it's it's something that kids play on the streets every single day. We play in school, mm -hmm. and um, so something that I was always really drawn to as a kid, and um, influenced by, and um, yeah, I, I guess I had a natural talent for it. My dad used to play football, and I think um, you got you got scouted. For, for Liverpool? Yeah, I got scouted. I initially was playing for um, a team called Berry, that was in like the lower division. And then they, they actually bought me from Berry. Um, I think it was for like 100,000 pounds. At how yeah. old? I was 15. So <laughs> it, was con it was considered a lot of money at 15. Yeah. Um, in exchange, I think Berry used that money to um, build like a small development center for changing rooms and went towards kits and stuff like that. So that's good. It to good yeah, it went to good use. That's great. So started me at Berry and then I signed to Liverpool at 15 years of age. You were 15 when you signed to Liverpool? Yeah, I was only 15. Um, wow. Again, I went, Berry was a center of excellence and then Liverpool was an academy. They had all of the best facilities to like um, train youngsters and give them the best opportunity going on and making it professionally and in terms of development of being 15 and being signed to such a conglomerate what was the pressure like that for you as a 15 year old um i didn't really see or feel the pressure mm -hmm. to be honest with you. i mean everybody around me did because it was such like um a huge team and, and such an achievement, but I just kind of took it in my stride. I think I just have one of those personalities, but um, mm -hmm. when I signed initially, I was, I was really overwhelmed with excitement, the fact of signing for such a big team. Yeah. And then I just took it within my stride and then it was always my ambition to go on and, and make, make it to the first team. That was like a will never happen type of pressure. And um, it was, I always had it in the back of my mind to achieve that. And um, it was such a, such a great, great experience. And Liverpool would really look after their youngsters and, and grooming them. You're into, a striker, right? I was a striker, yeah. Okay. I also played... That's the glory them. position, really. I mean, yeah, I wanted all of the attention. <laughs> um, the defenders and the rest of the team would do the work. And mm -hmm. I was got the, all, of the, all of the credit, but... Um, like anything in life, you need a good team to be successful. So I was always um, appreciative of my teammates. And um, I just happened to glory most of them. And then after Liverpool, was it to Blackpool? I remember you saying. Yeah, so I signed for Blackpool. Um, I signed a year contract with a year option. And um, I, I left Liverpool and, and, and signed there. And we did, we did really successful within the first 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. And then... The manager that actually signed me went to another team. So then a new manager came in and then he wanted to bring in his, his, his players to build his team. And throughout that first season, I picked up a couple of injuries. So my game time was pretty minimal. And then um, the second season I played, but it was inconsistent. And then I later on moved to Scotland 
and then I ended in Hungary of all places in one of the yeah. top divisions. How did you go with the language barrier? Um, it was okay. The manager had spent some time in Wales um, mm. and I'd say like two or three of the players spoke very good English, but the majority of the players there, they couldn't speak English. So um, I was fortunate that the, the, the senior players and the key players within the team understood English. But um, So you had football, some translators on your side? Yeah, we, we, I mean, football is like a, a common language once you're on the football field, you know, with the movements and, and um, the total tactical aspect. Um, and thankfully, the manager would give his analysis in Hungarian and then to me, he would break it down in English. Mm -hmm. um, so there wasn't really that much of a language barrier. And I think when he was playing against the opposition, if he was to ever say anything bad, um, I didn't understand it. So it didn't really make a difference. And then you, we were talking the other day and, and you were telling me how you were 25 when you retired. We talked about retirement. Yeah. Tell me how that comes about and how, you know, I, we've obviously had a previous discussion about it um, when we caught up and, and talking about the pressures that you had and that you had other passions that you wanted to pursue and it wasn't necessarily football, 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 even though, you know, your dad would have loved you to, to keep playing and, you know, family members probably would have loved you to keep playing, but uh, you're a man of your own person. So you wanted to do something different, which is really admirable that you followed, you know, your heart and your gut as to what you wanted to do. Yeah. I mean, I mean, socially, um, anybody, and we're all guilty of it, um, we're kind of preconditioned to our, our parents and what our parents want. And when you're considered good or exceptional, or in, in my case, I was in the 1%, only 1% of, the population of young boys ever get to play professionally and I played at such an high level. Mm -hmm. I think the emotional attachment towards playing for so long and um, the future potential, I had to really consider that for my long-term happiness. Yeah. And um, through negotiating a couple of contracts at Liverpool at such a young age and then onto Blackpool and the other teams that I played for, I really took a uh, an interest in the business element when it comes to, to business and the business side of football. Mm -hmm. And um, it just really intrigued me, like negotiations, um, understanding business, because although Liverpool is a football club, it's, it's still a limited company at the end of the day. So it's it still has all of the functionalities of a business. Yeah. And then um, I was fortunate that one of my close friends had, had started a business at the time in, in sportswear and in fashion. Um, and then it gave me like a, a, a closer insight to business. And I've always been passionate about um, fashion and style and product and design. So then um, I started to look into that. And you stemmed into what you now have as you're the CEO and director of Peaches Sport, a, fit, a fitness active wear label that's specifically for women. Which I yeah. thought was really interesting when we were talking about it. I was like, okay, specifically for women, Nathan. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and especially the name of the brand, Peaches, raised a few eyebrows, I bet. I'm sure. Uh, but yeah, um, so I went to LA on holiday and everybody in LA, especially the females over there, was when he wasn't wearing... Um, like I guess the formal or, or smart casual attire in the in the evenings, they was wearing um, athleisure clothing, mm -hmm. and um, they took health and lifestyle and combined it together. And in the UK, I thought it was missing that. And um, again, at the time, I was still playing football, mm -hmm. so I did a bit of research and I I read that eighty percent of the household buying is predominantly bought by women, um, and then. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as 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 men, um, <laughs> I have a feeling that 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 tide is turning a little bit because I see a lot of males that are certainly consumers. Yeah, I mean, it depends on on the industry, right? Sure. And I think men these days are, 
are trying to look after themselves a lot better these days. Um, but I just feel from the social aspect, there's a, there's a lot of pressure, I would say, towards women to have having to look a certain way or there's a certain standard that is supposed to be kept mm -hmm. uh, from society, which I think is unfair. I think that's uh, been the case for millennia. Women have had that stigma of looking a certain way and, and behaving a certain way. And so, yeah, I understand yeah. where you're coming from. And there was, and, and, and for me, I, I being raised by my, my mother and um, my father, but majority my mother in a household, mm -hmm. I have an older sister as well. I understand the pressures that are placed on women by men and society, and um, especially in the, the fitness industry and the fitness world. Mm -hmm. um, and I just come from an unbiased um, perspective when it comes to what people should be and how people should be addressed. And it's often from the ideology of another person. And I'm of the belief in that. Of course. Of people course. Should be themselves and be loved for themselves, not to appear to be something that they're not or to please, sorry, please somebody mm -hmm. else. And in the fitness industry alone, one thing that I wanted to change is how women were seen and viewed. Mm -hmm. And also the stigma that's attached to, to the fitness industry. Some people are made to be, be made to, made out to be, uh, to feel guilty for not working out every day or not to have a certain figure or body type. Sure. And that, I'm a big believer in um, something's better than nothing. So if you work out for 10 minutes or for one hour, mm -hmm. it's better than nothing. If you um, take pieces out of your diet, that would improve your long-term health. Um, I'm a believer of that. So I just wanted to bring something new to the fashion industry. Yeah. And once I to have a little bit of success and I understood that there was, um, there was an audience that wanted something that wasn't biased and was a little bit different to the, to the social norm. Yeah. Um, so where yeah. is the company sitting at now in terms of where you want it to be? Do you want it to grow? How, how do you see it in the next, say, you know, three years? Yeah, well, we're sitting in a good position. I mean, as far as the e-commerce platform, we're doing very well. Mm -hmm. um, we're trying to be within the guidelines of business and what's ethical and what's not. Mm -hmm. And I think for the next three years, we really want to grow the company to be like a household name, especially in the UK and, and worldwide. I know at the minute our, our sales are internationally very good, um, but we want to have that like hold on, on the UK to be regarded as the, the top sportswear company for women mm -hmm. um, in the future and then we also want to branch off i'd i'd love to do seminars and and let's say talks towards women and and the the bias and the i guess the pressure that is put on them just That's to have a amazing to hear it from a male perspective because we often have women out there on the the speaking circuit and, and talking about the pressures that are on us as, as females and how to combat that and and so forth but to have a man speak about it i think can sometimes hit home a little bit more so than just hearing or well, not just hearing but hearing a, a fellow woman talk about it i think it would be really interesting coming from a male perspective yeah i mean friends friends of mine female friends they've all they've always said that i should do a podcast and and for me it's about education you know I feel like if it wasn't for my mom or my sister I wouldn't I'd be uneducated in, in terms of the, the pressures that are put on women unbeknownst to men that we do and sometimes as men we can be hypocritical in in what we do and, and how we act and conduct ourselves and then expect um, something separate from a woman which is clearly unfair um, and it's just about opening that discussion and, and having a conversation to have a level of understanding so it's better for everybody you know absolutely and now you're here obviously you've been on lockdown here in Dubai for a couple of months um, which I don't think was the initial plan but is has been the plan now and you're thinking of perhaps spacing yourself more within the UAE and going back and forth to the UK is that correct am I correct in saying that I'm Correct, yeah. There seems to be a lot of like ex soccer players that are based in Dubai. And I, I understand that, you know, there are a lot that come for, um, 
for a summer and for quick getaways from the UK, you know, and into the sun. But it seems to be quite the haven for soccer players or ex-soccer players. I feel like Dubai has a lot to offer to everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of perks of, of living in Dubai. I, I've frequently visited Dubai for the past nine years now. And um, for the majority of that time, I was still playing football. So I was always limited to um, weekly periods, it two weeks at a maximum so there's still a lot of Dubai that is undiscovered for me personally um, but for me I think the lifestyle here is great there's a lot of opportunities I think there's a lot of a lot of good things to come out of Dubai that I don't think Europe or UK offers and vice versa for sure for sure feel like it'd be a great base for me to live and one day um, build my empire start my future and um there's a lot of good resources here, a lot of good people, which I've met. <laughs> one of them, Michael being one of them. So um, <laughs> um, it's going to be good. Yeah, we'll see if Michael ends up staying for a little longer. Be good. We're getting everyone from the UK over. <laughs> Everybody that I've spoken to, I mean, this was in the pipeline for me for a while and I finally took the plunge to do it a couple of months ago. Um, but a lot of people, it's, a, it's appealing to a lot of people. I mean, you're from... Australia, you've lived in this region for a long time also, so. Yeah, so many. And tell me, before we go, what has been your go-to saviour while it's been, you know, this incredibly difficult time in, in world history? So in terms of Netflix, hmm. you know, you've been close to the beach, so you, you've had pretty good, but. What have been like your saving graces during this time? Um, yeah, f- thankfully I've been close to the beach and um, I'm, I'm a very visual person. So I like to watch documentaries. So just when I feel like I need an escape, I'll put on like a motivational movie, mm-hmm. um, motivational podcast. Um, I read, I, I read quite frequently. So they've been my go-to. Um, and I think because everybody's in a similar predicament, um, it's just a level of understanding. Sometimes you can be a little bit selfish and expect people to be there to comfort you, um, but they're going through it as well. So yeah. I'm just trying to take accountability of, okay, well, I'm going through what I'm going through and what's the best solution for me. And for me, the best solution always is gratitude. Um, you're always better off than most people so I I try not to feel like um, this the right word would be grateful but (laughs) I feel like I'm oh I understand being being hard done by you know and I wake up every day in Dubai and the weather's hot the weather's nice and the people are always great so I always look at the positives rather than the negative. So I think my go-to has probably been podcast and then Netflix. Okay. Anyway, thank you so much for, for coming on this little segment of mine. You've been terrific and we're so glad to have you in here in the UAE and, and going forward and watching how your next phase of your career from football into you know, e-commerce translates and, and certainly onto the speaking circuit. I think it'll be amazing. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me. I've enjoyed being here. Listening to your questions. No problem. I'll see you soon. Okay, bye. Thanks, Nate.